the reason why we chose the Gospel of Thomas was because it's really the most famous of the Gnostic texts. It's one that a lot of people have heard of. And there's been a lot of discussion about when it was written. Some say it was written later, but others say various versions were written earlier and among the earliest. And so it was, it was a contender to be one of the gospels, like, you know, how Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, and Elaine Pagels talks a lot about why John was included and Thomas was excluded, even though John and Thomas both kind of have similar, well, I think Thomas actually has more similarities to Matthew, Mark, and Luke than John does. But we'll get into a little bit more of that in a minute, that she says that the reason why John was included, even though it diverged from the other three, whereas Thomas wasn't, because John is more God, or Jesus is God, Jesus is the Savior, and you have to convert people, and it was a more universal, kind of easy to follow, orthodox religion kind of version of God, whereas Thomas was more about you seek and you shall find, and there, it's not definitive that Thomas thinks that Jesus is actually God. Son of God, yes, but Thomas also implies that we're all children of God. So there's less focus on divinity in Thomas, and that's part of why it was seen as, her, as a heretical text. Um, but it has a lot of, it does have a lot of similar sayings as the three Gospels, but then it has some other stuff thrown in there that you read it and you go, what? but yeah. it's really interesting um, well I just like it because I really find the the, the figure of Thomas uh, compelling as even as described in John and I realize it's rather audacious for me to say that I disagree with Elaine Pagels particularly after you gave her a little description there but I do about certain points of what she said that are critical of Thomas not so much about the dispute between John and Thomas but I think people are far more critical of Thomas than they need be uh, because, you know, even Elaine Pagels focuses on this part about, he says, oh, I doubt, let me touch the, the, the wounds. So if you read the gospel, when he first appeared to the disciples, they said, let us, we don't believe you. Let us see your wounds. I mean, everybody forgets that that happened. <laughs> Secondly, because he, he did that, so, so that you know about, because at the end of the Gospel of John, the last thing in John is this whole scene with Thomas. And then he says, my Lord and my God, which is the most clear Christological statement of anybody in any, at least Orthodox Gospel, of Jesus being God and man. And the last chapter of John, which is chapter 20, 21, is believed to be an added chapter to let to do, to diminish the power of thomas mm -hmm. and to revert the power over to basically peter but um uh i think thomas is more like us like uh okay let's see it let's do it but he also is the greatest witness for us so mm -hmm. that's all my disagreement is i think she blasted thomas way too much as a caricature when i think that would be an academic who doesn't know how a sudden ordinary people who, sorry, sorry, let's just that sorry. way. Ordinary people who live on the, I'm an academic too, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Thomas is an interesting, interesting um, character. So anyway. When I was listening to you all talk in the beginning about what is heretical and it sounded to me like any form of spiritual thought outside of what's canonized is qualifies for heresy. Yeah. And what's so interesting about that is that there's intelligence that's written into the, the DNA of creation. Wisdom. Yeah. So, so this intelligence that's inside is actually, it has an ability to come up for us and we talk about that a lot in therapy, like what's coming up for you? Well, that's intelligence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with inspiration, it's in and it, it comes out. 
Right. Those right. Things, those things are a part of this gnosis, this this kingdom of heaven that's within us that is to be expressed outward. It's nothing that the world could put into us uh, per se on a certain level. It is it is actually an organic uh, thing that I feel like um, tradition is is trying to stifle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And in the sessions that you all missed before, that's part of why we talked about the history so much is because that's sort of the question. Who gets power when texts are excluded? Who right. loses power when texts are excluded? Who, who gets to define Christianity? Who gets to define God? And then who gets to control how people view God when they make that definition? And so the fact that Augustine and Constantine and the Roman Empire were the ones that decided the creed when Rome was actually who killed Jesus, <laughs> for me, that sounds very problematic. And when you look at what has been done in the name of Christianity since the time the empire took it over, it's very like they tried to make it orthodox. And if you know, the word orthodox means universal. And so what Thomas is really saying in his gospel is that it isn't universal. The early Christian church was super diverse. There was Thomas school of thought, there was Peter, you know, there was all these different interpretations because at the time after Jesus was crucified, as we all know, uh, Rome sacked the temple like 67 AD. And so you can imagine there's a lot of chaos. And so you have this division in the Jewish community, not only because the temple is destroyed, but they have Christ who is being debated, was Christ the Messiah, was, not, was Christ not the Messiah? And in their terms, Messiah meant king. And so the fact that Jesus was executed on the cross, it really confused people even more. Because if Jesus was supposed to be the king and save them from oppression, why did, why did God let him be killed? And so that set confusion, and that also added to the diversity of ideas. And Can I just, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, oh. I want to go with what Thaddeus said, because um, if you go to verse 5 of Thomas. Mm -hmm. um, hi, Millie. Uh, it says, Yeshua said, recognize what is in front of you and what is hidden from you will be revealed. There is nothing hidden that will not be revealed, which is kind of a, a it, it sounds cryptic, but it's not. I mean, it's almost saying, look, you can keep trying to hide these other ideas mm -hmm. from the people, but as long as you keep pursuing, like Thaddeus says, either what's in you or what's outside of you, then you're gonna find it anyway, right? They're never going to stifle all these thoughts because some of what's in here is very similar to like Buddhist thought or um, Confucius thought, um, you know, so uh, I think it's almost like they built in their own defense, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're trying to say your school's right, your school's right, or I don't want you to see that because if you saw that, right? Mm -hmm. then you might change your mind. And we have a lot of that censorship going on even now, both politically and what's always going on, right? Right. Um, and then this part in verse 3 says, um, I'm going to the middle of verse 3, the kingdom is inside you and it is outside you. Mm -hmm. When you know yourself, then you will be known and you will know that you are the child of the living father. But if you do not know yourself, you will be live in vain and you will be vanity, right? Mm -hmm. So that's very similar to that notion of uh, God within, God without. Well, St. Francis of Assisi has this whole prayer. God is in front of me, it's beside me, he's in me, he's up top of me. You know, I mean, he's, yeah. So uh, and it's that's a traditional Celtic prayer also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Oh, my version says poverty rather than vanity. Oh, okay. So does mine. It does. Sorry. What version do you have, Leslie? I have the scholar's version. The okay, I think I do too, because I have the Nag Hammadi. The yeah, whole. This, is the, this is the Jesus seminar version. Oh, okay. But yeah, yeah, this is just, um, I just, the only one I could find the text in, so at the library. But it's still the same idea, right? Absolutely. I just want to make note of it for yeah. everyone here. Well, I also noticed that it looks like this was in, actually in Coptic, which is yes. according to my book. It says this, Coptic was the common language of Egypt during the Christian period, mm -hmm. which is a translation of the original, which was probably written in Greek, it says. Yep. So it's a translation. Is, is Coptic even a, a living language? Probably not, if I had to make a guess. <laughs> I don't well, they do, they do still have Coptic Christians in Egypt. Yes, hmm. it's one of the branches of orthodoxy. There's like Eastern yeah. Orthodoxy, Coptic Christianity. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so I this, that was interesting. they have both the, the translated Coptic and they have the Greek Gospel of Thomas. So if you have this book, you can actually compare. And it looks like the Greek Gospel of Thomas, which starts for you, Jill, on page 154. It is, <clears throat> it only has 39 sayings instead of 114. And so I think what happened is that more of the Greek version was destroyed over the years. And when they, and I could be wrong about this. I could be misremembering, but I believe it's because the Coptic was found later. It was found in a more full version because it was hidden so well. Um, so that's my explanation that I recall about why it's so much longer. But there's gist. You can tell that it's the same thing because they have a lot of similarities. It's just not as full as the Coptic version. I wanted to start this part of the discussion for those of you who read it. I want you to tell me what what hit you as like, oh, I like that. And what kind of hit you as, you know, what now? <laughs> because there's a there's some stuff that's similar to the Bible, like I said, of the chosen canon. But then there's other parts that really make you go, hmm. Well, you know, you get to something like uh, seven, which is probably why I then went and got a language Fagel's book. But it says, Joshua said, um, Fortunate is the lion eaten by a human, for a lion becomes human. Unfortunate is the human eaten by a lion, for a human becomes a lion. I guess it is you are what you eat, right? Um, <laughs> sort of, yeah. Well, right? You no, know, Jesus is depicted as the lion of Judah. Mm -hmm. So if we're, if we're consuming this lion as humans, then what we're doing is we're becoming what we eat like you say, right. instead of physically being eaten up by an animal. So in this, uh, they have a little footnote in this version, yeah. and it says, here the lion seems to symbolize what is passionate and bestial in human experience. A person may consume the lion or be consumed by it. And in that case, it could be kind of, you know, how the other gospels kind of talk about the spiritual versus the worldly. You know, if you're consumed by worldly concerns or if you're consumed by spiritual concerns is kind of how I interpret it. Yeah, because the lion is a symbol of the king. Here, maybe. Yeah, I kind of like that. Thaddeus is, yeah. Yes, that's the way I'm, that's the way I'm understanding that. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know, because then the lion becomes human instead of the human becoming a lion. But anyway, yeah, so there are, are these, but then you get to, to what they consider uh, verses or sections later. You have what's in the gospel. Once a sower went out and sowed a handful of seeds. Some fell on the road, some were eaten by birds, some by the thorns, some by whatever. Um, Elaine Pagel says that some of this discrepancy may be, because it says at the very beginning, I think, which is, um, these are the words of the secret. Mm. They were revealed by the living Jesus, and Thomas wrote them down. So Elaine Pagels speculates that there are secret words of Jesus that 
were only known by the disciples. Um, and that for whatever reason, uh, not, uh, Thomas wrote some of them down and then they speculate that some of these come from the same source that uh, was being used. The Q source. Uh, yes, the Q source. But there's a part of me that says even the ones that seem a little strange, <clears throat> not really strange. We sort of, I, I am the bread of life, eat me and whatever. We don't, we don't think twice about that. But if you really think about what he's saying, right? You become bread. It, Right, like who says that, right? But we, so there's a part of me that did react strongly to some of this, but there's a part of me that says, and I'm not, I'm not into a dispute whether they are or not Jesus's words, but a part of me says the only reason these seem strange is not that there's not strange things in the canon gospels, it's just we haven't heard it before. Right. And we have had it. Nobody's told us what it means, which I guess means I went out and looked for somebody to tell me what it means, which is bad, I guess. But you know, I needed to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's just fascinating to have these written down, you know. And, you know, Pagel makes this same point as you about, you know, it being unfamiliar to us. And that's what makes it strange because the, she talks about just about how strange it is to think that someone died, was crucified, and rose from the dead three days later. I mean, there's strangeness in there. There's some strangeness in the parables. So she kind of says this very similar to what you just said too, Ellen. Right, there, there's one of the gospels, I don't, at the time of Jesus's death, the earth opened up and the dead walked. I mean, it's in the gospels that we read. We just sort of sanitize it, but you know. So I don't know, that was my uh, initial impression without I mean, each one of these we could study for quite some time. Well, I was just thinking about various things. First of all, it's amazing how what you get used to, you like. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, and that's kind of how we are with the, the Gospels and, and with, well, with the Bible in general. And it's really not a pleasant, comfortable book, you know? Just not. It's just we've been conditioned to say, think it that way. I know what I was going to say. And that is that really that, you know, Jesus certainly did have private teaching as you don't throw a lot of stuff at the general public. And the geeks and nerds are a perfect example. Of, yeah. Oh, my gosh. If there were some people that knew what we were talking about in there, they <laughs> yeah. throw us out of the church. <laughs> That's why they part of the church. That's just right. So you know. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's like, and, and there's things that you, that I would talk about in Geeks and Nerds that I would not talk about in the general public. And one of the problems is that the general public, I hate to say this, but most people who, who are, who go to churches have gotten stuck at about a third grade, fourth grade, mother says fourth grade, understanding of the Bible and understanding of Christianity. And that's fine if you're in the fourth grade. It's not so fine if you're 50 or 60 years old. Mm -hmm. And that's, and I think that Jesus probably had to deal with that. And Paul had to deal with that. All of the apostles had to deal with this, you know, this fourth grade understanding of the Bible, fourth grade understanding of Christianity. But you've got other people that are moving farther along. And it, I think it's, I think this goes back to the thing about diversity. You've got to, you've got to have people at various stages and you hope that they keep growing. So I hope that makes sense. Like, I, when, I, when I listen to you talk about this fourth grade uh, uh, spiritual level, it yeah. sounds like um, uh, where the Bible depicts the people as sheep. And then you hear folks uh, being depicted as lions. Mm were able to achieve such. Mm -hmm. But in the number 10, um, where it says, I have cast a fire upon the world and see I'm guarding it until it blazes. That strikes me as this conversation that you can't have with the general public is the fire. And that this fire is actually gonna mm -hmm. be brought forth at a certain time. 
as as part of the awakening, as part of revelation, as part of the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. one of the things we've discussed in earlier is that it's kind of like baby food versus adult food. And in the history, the Orthodox, because they wanted it to be universal and controllable, they had a vested interest in not having so many questions. And so if you're going to grow and you're going to increase your spiritual um, awakening, you have to ask questions to do that. But those questions can disrupt power. And so even in the church today, people are not encouraged to ask questions that seem heretical because it's almost like if you pull the thread, it all falls apart. And so you have... But that's what they're afraid of. They're yeah. afraid... It, that will happen. Absolutely. But not necessarily the case. You know? Exactly. I mean, I ask questions, you know, as Leslie was saying, we ask a ton of questions and we talk about stuff. Of course, we put it online. So if the world knows and they decide we're heretics, that's up to them, right? But we do ask the questions because we want to know. And as he interpreted that one, I, that's what I, that's why we decided to study Gnostics in the first place is because we want to go to the higher level because what is just spoon fed from the pulpit usually is pretty pat, pretty cut and dry, pretty much just this is the way it is, peace. And, and Jesus, God, I mean, God is bigger than all of that. So how could we put such simplicity on such a complex entity as God? God is bigger than the universe and and you know all of these things there's no way for us to truly understand god because the concept of god is so much bigger so why would some be excluded you always go back to why i mean i always go back to why and it sounds like y'all do too <laughs> yeah here's the address oh, oh go ahead leslie i was gonna let you go ahead but i was gonna say another thing is that we've been conditioned to worry about disagreement and the Jewish traditional way was to argue. Absolutely. And my mother, who's sitting over here, one time Ellen and I got into an argument in Sunday school. No. So what? We think, you know, and we don't always think the same thing. I don't think less of Ellen just because she argues with me. I think more of Ellen because she argues with me. And that is a concept that I think people in power don't want to be questioned and don't want to be argued with. And, you know, I'm sorry, I don't agree with mom on everything. I don't agree with Ellen on everything. I don't agree with Jody on everything. But you got to think, you got to think. And a lot of times you have to argue with somebody else and with yourself before you, it's the only way you really learn. And the Jews understood that. Absolutely. Well, it, it's also a, uh, just to, I'm going to go to you and then go to the number 13, but it's also a regional thing. In New York, we argued everything to death, right? <laughs> At least, I mean, till, till, till the end, you know. Um, but there are also uh, a greater mix of, of cultures and ethnicities and things there. Um, but um, there is sort of a Midwestern politeness that is also uh, fostered by many of the political systems and stuff to keep it that way. So number 13 though, kind of goes along with this notion that uh, I think you'll recognize these kind of people. So Joshua says to his disciples, what am I like for you? To what would you compare me? So Simon P Peter, of course, always trying to impress Jesus says, that was my, I, 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 I added that. It's not in the topic, Peter trying to impress Jesus. <laughs> you are like a righteous angel. Then Matthew says, you are like a wise philosopher. And Thomas says, Master, my mouth could never utter what you are like. I like Thomas. And, and so then what Jesus says, which sort of conveys he likes Thomas is, I am no longer your master because you have drunk and become drunken from the same bubbling source from which I spring. Then he took Thomas aside and said three words to him. When Thomas returned to his companions, they questioned him, what did Joshua say 
to you. Thomas said, if I told you even one of the things he said to me, you would pick up stones and throw them at me. And fire would come out of those stones and consume you. So in other words, it's going back with that notion of the different levels of understanding and the different, that sometimes if we were to hear these things, like Leslie and you all have been saying, our response would not be to like it, but to resist it. And so there's a lot of this going on in this gospel where there seems to be these sort of, even amongst the, the apostles, um, there were different levels of understanding and different levels of trying to relate to Jesus. Like, it seems to me the first three were trying to say the nicest, kindest things to Jesus. And Thomas, being a good old sort of, probably would have fit right in in Geeks and Nerds, like, I, I, what am I going to tell you? You know who you are. Come on. Right? That's what I kind of think. It's kind of cool. I think the first answers contain limits. Mm. Yeah. And, and Thomas was willing to say, you know what? I don't understand the limits of you. Mm. And that right there put him in a different category Absolutely. than everyone else. Because how can we, how can we homogenize, you know, Jesus down to a philosopher or a teacher or, you know, he's so many different things, just like we are. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't be boiled down just to citizen or, you know, family member or, or male or, or female. male female yeah it's it's uh it's a lot more to us so there has to be much more to god well it's interesting the thing right under what yeah. you quoted um 14 then it says jesus said yeah. to them if you fast you will bring sin upon yourselves and if you pray you will be condemned and if you give to charity, you will harm your spirits. That sounds pretty contradictory to what we hear, right? Normally, like fasting is good in the other gospels, as long as you don't tell people about it. And the same with charity, you know, don't let the left hand know what the right is doing. Um, and if you pray, you will be condemned. If you but you're supposed to pray without ceasing in other gospels. So when I read that, I thought that was one of those, those that made me go, hmm, that's interesting. Right, I, I, I see it might be more about, you know, there's the sayings in the gospels that, because uh, I've been reading it lately, it, Jesus, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and it's like, look, John was an ascetic. He didn't drink, he didn't dance, he didn't, he lived out on the berries in the wild. You didn't like him. Hey. I come, I drink, I eat with whoever. You don't like me. It's kind of like, I'm wondering who the you is. Well, so it, I, I'm wondering, because the next thing is when you go into the land and walk through the countryside, if they welcome you, eat and whatever they offer. Remember the same saying, you go and they reject you, kick the, shake the dust. So I'm not sure if he's really saying, fast or pray is wrong or good or a saying no matter what standards you set somebody will say you're wrong mm. right going along with that idea of this um effort to hom homogenize mm -hmm. christianity uh that we're always at risk of now, I'm making this stuff up. I don't know. I didn't read it in Coptic, but, well, you know. I mean, it's, it's part of us, like, studying it, right? We don't have the answers. But, and then, so that was point four, but then point five, I think, in, maybe this might have something to do with it. For what goes into your mouth will not defile you. Rather, it is what comes out of your mouth that will defile you. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. perhaps and that's what's in the gospels, the orthodox gospels also. The yeah. power of the tongue. Like, yeah. Well, so it's I what it's, to... Go ahead. No, it's that's in one of the that's that's also in uh Matthew and Mark as well. And I I have to look it up here, but um but you know it's it's not what comes out it's it's what goes it's not what goes into you food just passes through your body it's mm -hmm. what comes out that does the damage it's what you say that's what he was that's and it's like then in the gospels they make it a statement 
against the Jewish um, food restrictions. Right. Right. Like what is to the symbol for one is not symbol yeah. for another, and yeah. Right, and you can't eat this, and you can't eat that, or you will defile yourself, and it's kind of a. Yeah. See that right there is making me feel like Jesus is saying, "Don't be legalistic about your faith." Like. Mm. Right. Like withholding food from yourself is not going to deliver you. Mm. Prayer in and of itself is not going to deliver ah, Very good, yeah. Giving charity in and of itself is not going to deliver you. I, I, I feel that. And if you think about the fact that charity is not the same as justice, and what does the Lord require of us? but to walk humbly and do just have mercy and do justice, right? right? Micah 6, 8. So, you know, that's a big problem in the church. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, so, oh, you know, that, you know what that brings up for me, what you said? When we say thoughts and prayers, mm -hmm. when there's something terrible that happens, whether it's a storm or a shooting or whatever, we just say thoughts and prayers and it's it's like we abdicate of our ourselves of any type of responsibility beyond saying thoughts and prayers the politician way, this is what marks what's interesting what matthew and mark precede this i mean this uh with um i'm going to read from mark and it says how expert you've become at putting aside god's commandment to establish your own tradition for instance, Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and those who curse their father and or mother will surely die. But I say, if people say to their mother or father, whatever I have spent, whatever, whatever I might have spent to support you is korban, which means consecrated to God, you, they, you no longer let those persons do anything for their father or mother. So you end up invalidating God's word with your own tradition, which you then perpetuate. And, and you do all kinds of other things like that. Listen to me and try to understand. It's not what goes into a person from the outside that can defile. Rather, it's what comes out of the person that defiles. So that's the, and there's something, it's very similar to that in, um, you know, in, in Matthew. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart strays far away from me. Their worship of me is empty because they insist on teaching, teachings that are human regulations. And then he goes, listen and try to understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person. Rather, it comes, it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles the person. And again, I'm reading from the Jesus seminar version, not the traditional gospels that we're used to listening to. And quite frankly, our gospels have been rather watered down from what you read in the scholar's version. Mm -hmm. I met, oh, probably 15, 20 years ago, I read a passage from the scholar's version where Jesus was basically saying, you know, he was chewing out Pharisees and he used, this, used some rather harsh language. And I read it in class and one of the ladies in class looked at me and goes, I don't think Jesus would have talked like that. And she never came back to Sunday school again. Wow. Oh, well. I thought after that, well, uh, he... She never came back to your class. She never came back to my class again. I don't know what... She went to she more baby food class. <laughs> she didn't go to my class again. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, you know, you don't seem to object to the story about Jesus driving the money changers out of the temple. Right. Uh, so anyway, maybe they didn't quote him. Maybe they didn't quote him. I don't know. But, but it was funny. This lady kind of whimpered, "Oh, I don't think Jesus would have talked like that." And Tracy Bonham, who is still in the Geeks and Nerds, goes, "Jesus was a real guy." <laughs> oh, Tracy, high five. High five. Wait, but I want to hear from Jeanette and Jill, because I've occasionally heard from you, Jeanette, but I, I okay. feel like you have more to say. And Jill. Uh, but okay, um, I'll start with, I'll start, if that's okay. Okay. Um, I'm looking at number 36 and 37. Mm -hmm. um, it says, Jesus says, um, don't fret from morning to evening and from evening to morning about what you're going to wear. 
<laughs> and number 37 is his disciples said, when will you appear to us? And when will we see you? Jesus says, when you strip without being ashamed and you take your clothes and put them under your feet like little children and trample them, then you will see the son of the living one and you will not be afraid. So for me, that means um, when you are comfortable with yourself, when you think that you're doing the right thing, and when you're, um, when you've made peace with yourself, you know, then you can come to see um, Jesus, I guess, you know, that's kind of, I think that's kind of empowering, because it's not like you have to do this, this, and this, but you just have to, you have to look inside and do what you think is right, you know, on a consistent basis, kind of. I also hear you saying from a mental health standpoint that you are accepting yourself. Yeah, exactly. Are you accepting self, but you're accepting the creation of God as you. So if, so if, you know, you well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> the world is saying, you know, you're this, you're that, and you're the other thing. And God is saying, well, you're mine. You're, you know, you That's come fine. from me, you know, and I'm your source. And if you can strip away all of your clothing, not just your physical clothing, but all of the shellac that the world has the put labels. on you mm -hmm. just through the years of conditioning, if you can drop those worldly clothes also, then you can see yourself as who God says you are mm -hmm. and not who the world says you are. Mm -hmm. Right. When you can when, can when you can see yourself and not be ashamed, then yeah, yeah it's more about right. that self acceptance than you doing anything because I think those other uh, numbers that we looked at earlier mm -hmm. were talking about you know it's not necessarily the physical aspect or it's not necessarily the legalistic aspects of things, but it it is this kinship that we're that we're getting close to talking about with God that I'm excited to talk about more. But I'm waiting. <laughs> yeah. And it's kind of what I re referred to in the beginning. The gnosis is the knowledge of self. And know yeah. yourself on the inside, meaning your heart, your soul, who God made you, like, like what you said. That when you know yourself, you know God. And mm -hmm. so the, the Gnostics are saying that we are children of God. Just as the Bible says, you know, we are God's children of the most high. Right. You know, that we're all made in God's image. So it's, it's like you said, stripping away. And mm -hmm. yeah, I think that that is a yeah. Way to look at it. I like that. Yeah. That's cool. I like this. I like that one, you know, but some of them seem still, still seem kind of crazy. But yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we could, we could definitely spend a lot of time. <laughs> we could definitely spend a lot of time on this. <laughs> on these uh, each one of them probably yeah this is my favorite of all the writings by the way oh okay oh, this I, love, I love the gospel of thomas what about you jill what stood out for you um well a lot of things <laughs> so i think that uh i was kind of surprised at the so many similarities with the other gospels, you know, where he touches on you know, the mustard seed and the beatitudes and, you know, all those sort of things. So that, that was a real, that was kind of a pleasant surprise because I, I, I guess I didn't anticipate that getting into the, into this particular gospel. And then, um, my, really my favorite part overall is the many references of the light that we already have the light, that he is the light. And that really squares nicely with my kind of Celtic traditional beliefs, if you will, the, that kind of a spiritual belief of, uh, you know, the Celtics believing that we already have the light within us. It's not something that we have to attain. It's already there. We just had to find a way to reveal it. And I really liked some of those parallels in in Thomas to that kind of belief. Um, so that was, I really enjoyed that. Um, and I and I and I'm not sure who was referencing this because my iPad died. I've never had this happen. It got too hot. 
because oh, I was outside, so I had to cool everything down. But oh. I'm not sure who the one was who referenced this about um, the, it being like the Bible being kind of uh, the way religion is taught. It's kind of a fourth grade level, mm -hmm. and it's it, that got me to thinking that in reading this, it does take a lot of effort and study and interpretation because there are some um, contradictions even within the book itself, not even against other uh, gospels, but just within this book itself, I thought. Um, so I thought that was a really clever uh, mention. And I can see how this book, uh, knowing the context, the historical context at that time, I can see why this book did not make it in. <laughs> it's pretty clear. Um, and then I think the the one that was really kind of shocked me a little was at the end, the very last line. Yes, mm -hmm. and, I, and I I knew you were probably waiting for that to come up. Of course. But for me, the way I I understood that and interpreted that was, and I know there is a footnote about it in the book itself to kind of give you guidance. But before reading that footnote, what I looked at that was almost Jesus was already acknowledging sexism you know at that point in time and was kind of his way of um acknowledging that mm -hmm. um so those were kind of the highlights i guess if you will that not getting into every single verse but i like i like kind of following along what we've been doing here and picking out the verses and kind of kind of digesting and and taking some time to discuss. So I hope we kind of continue down that road for a while. But there By you the go, way, in a nutshell. I'm, I'm with you, Jill. My favorite is if they say to you, where have you come from? Say to them, we have come from the light, from the place where the light came into being yeah. by itself, established and appeared in their image. If they say to you, is it you? <coughs> say, we are its children and we are the chosen of the living father. And if they say to you, what is the evidence that your father is in you, say to them, it is motion and rest. You know, that's, that is so powerful when, and I, I, we've talked about this in Geeks and Nerds, when you realize you are a child of God, and, you know, God could ask, God, God asked a lot of Jesus, and there's no reason why he cannot ask his daughters and sons here the same things and that really blows the establishment away when we all because when we all realize we are all children of god mm -hmm. and that's really you know that's that's the new testament thinking and this is you know we are children of god that's in the first letter of john also well it's other places but that's where where he gets where the author of the first letter of john the john's first epistle gets really blatant about that Mm -hmm. I agree with you, and I think that that's uh, partially why that concept appeals to me anyway, because it puts the power back into our hands mm -hmm. and not in the hands of the church authority to deign it upon you that you are a child of God or that you must accomplish all of these tasks and these feats and these. It takes away that structure. It takes away that power from them. Um. Uh that was so powerful. I almost want to say, amen, we're done. <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> put on that freedom. Yeah. Yeah. It gives us freedom. You know, uh, we were watching Elaine Pagel earlier, and she was talking about the original creation, the mm -hmm. Adam, which was neither male nor female. And we see that language in scripture where God is neither male nor female. And that when that, when that creation was divided into a binary, male and female and then one of the one of the uh gospel i mean one of the uh numbers there asks us well what do we do once we become two you know you've been one now you become two now what do you do well we become one again because because spirit is always interested in us being made whole and this com becoming one is if you're a man you have to become more of a woman to balance that if you're a woman you have to become this is spiritually mm -hmm. more like a man 
And and when you put those two together, you you do have a light that, that the scripture said, do not hide under the bushel basket. So we do have a light that's in us and we've been cautioned not to hide it. Mm -hmm. And she kind of says that that's, um, well, her and the, the notes, they're kind of saying, besides the wholeness, um, it's, a, it's a spiritual rejoining. You know, the, the worldliness, the human form is the division, mm -hmm. but the spiritual form is the unification. Yeah, because there's freedom in that, because in the world, women can only do this, and men can only do that. And so when we eliminate that nonsense, we become fully informed as, as humans and we're able to operate in whatever arena uh, we want to outside of gender. And so it's always, it seems like the world is always interested in creating more division, creating more layers and more descriptions, you know, to just, again, back to watering down the creation and the word. And that goes back to what Jeanette was saying when you picked that passage about being naked and how we kind of tied to being naked of clothes is also being naked of labels. And so, you know, going to your core and like having your core be whole, like that's the spiritual journey. Like when you level up and you can see those things, it takes you to a higher spiritual level. So mm -hmm. I can see how it all ties together in our understanding. We talk a lot about working from a place of rest, mm. which which sounds a lot like uh, when Leslie motion talked and about this motion and, and rest. So how can you be at rest and be in motion? Well, I mean, we know that an object will tend to travel in the same direction at the same velocity until it's impacted by something. Well, it could be just propelled through the, through the universe. It may not be moving in and of itself, but the propulsion that's driving it is making it move. So is it moving or is it resting? And it's saying 106. I'm gonna just read <laughs> that real quick. Okay. That that was deep. That was deep, Thad. Yeah, that was that I'm, was so I get to talk like it's this. To be real. <laughs> In 106, speaking of, of of one becoming two, in 106 Jesus said, when you make the two in one, you will become children of humanity. And when you say, mountain, move from here, it will move. Hmm. And we got a mountain right now called racism and white supremacy <laughs> that we're trying to move out the way. And it's a lot in patriarchy and it's a lot of uh, division amongst ourselves, not only as a group, but as individuals, we're divided mm -hmm. along these understandings of ourselves. And once we come back to just balance, just using balance, then we can we can tell that mountain to get out of the way. What verse was that, um, Amy? Uh, 106, or 106, sorry. 106, okay. Oh, I see. Yes. Yes. And it's just sim that's similar to the gospel, but it's it's from a different perspective. You know, it's if you really, really, really believe, you can move the mountain. But this is a little different. Mm -hmm. It's when you eliminate the division from God and God's creation. I got being when we eliminate our division from what is holy. Mm -hmm. That's when we have the power, and since that power lays within us, is what everybody's saying in union with God, that's where the power comes from. Absolutely. And I hear that word holy is not just, uh, you know, uh, no, no, no. I hear it oh, as no. holy. W-H-O. Holy. Right. Holy. Yes. Holy. And my idea of holy is not that kind of thing. It's that moment. I almost feel that this conversation is holy. It's this moment of sacred uh like I'm feeling very inspired by the conversation, right? You know, or uh, that we're all exploring together and all these different ideas are coming together. So that's when I feel life is cool, you know, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Good. 